Were you ready to go on the spiritual journey? Were you spiritual before? Or were you Were you seeking that? When When I really tap into spirituality and understanding it from somebody who realized what spirituality is and could explain it to me, and that's when a lot of shifts started to happen. My life was not serving me well. I was in a terrible state, and I I did not want to look at myself. I stopped meeting people because I felt embarrassed of who I'd become. I had hit my rock bottom at that point. Yes. So I remember going through those exact moments where I stopped taking photos. I stopped, you know, being active on social media. I stopped posting because I didn't want to be photographed. I didn't want people to look at me. You yes. somehow, you know, you want to become invisible and not yes. be not be seen. I was going through various cycles of IVF and failing terribly at it. It was like a big slap on my face. Did you uh, want kids? Yes, yes. That is something that I always wanted. I remember holding his hand and and I told him, if my God or my teacher. Or whoever in the universe loves me and is putting me through this challenge again, I will be rewarded for enduring this pain. I have to finish a learning, and this time I want to do it for once and for all. Do you need a tissue? <laughs> <laughs> do we both need tissues? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've shared this story a few times, but I've I've never felt it so emotionally. I think it's your presence or it's our connection, whatever it is, and uh, I'm, I'm tearing up. Can we take a break, please? Hi Charul, welcome to Sustainable Tea with Shreya. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you Shreya, it's a pleasure being here. You're an incredibly successful businesswoman, HR veteran, environmental supporter, YouTuber, keynote speaker, winner of Mrs. UAE International 2021, yes. Yes. and of course an Amazon best-selling author. Yeah. I'm sure there's 10 other things that you do that I, that I might have missed, and you wear so many hats and you wear them so beautifully. Tell me about how you do it all and you do it all so well. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I always say this when everybody goes with the titles that you've mentioned. Uh, I, I feel like a mini celebrity in myself. You right? are. <laughs> I mean, take full credit for that. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a beautiful journey. There have been a lot of bumps on the road. Um, I sit here looking all glorious and accomplished. Uh, but there is beautiful backstories to it. I do not call them bad memories anymore because I'm very grateful uh, for all that has happened because that is what has allowed me to become who I am. And uh, mind you, the journey isn't over, right? So the challenges continue. Uh, I have to win my own battles. And uh, yes, there is a long list of things which is on my vision board, which is what my life should look like uh, in the way I define my life. Tell me more about what's on your vision board for 2024. Uh, there are a few things. Uh, the first, like I was indicating, is uh, offering yourself as a service to community, right? There's so much that each one of us does for our own. And uh, rightfully so. We have a life and we have ambitions for ourselves. But at some point, we have to look at how we can add value to the society which has shaped us to becoming who we are, right? Um, so my focus really is on uh, child education, especially girl child education, uh, sports scholarship. So we have already registered our foundation in India, uh, which is my home country. Yeah. So the foundation is up and running. So it's not just a thought process. We are actually executing it because that's where the fun lies. That's where the magic is. So the foundation will start to focus on enabling girl child education starting in India. And then, of course, you know, the, the world is the playground, uh, but the focus is on India and uh, providing sports scholarship for students who, you know, cannot afford to go to school, let alone, you know, fulfill their desire of pursuing a sport as a career. Right. Uh, other than that, I'm launching uh, my something that I will personally deliver is public speaking workshops. These will be public programs. So that's amazing. Yeah, uh, I would love for you to come and join us as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Uh, Please we'll take me under your wings. <laughs> <laughs> we'll also be doing workshops on book writing. After I have taken this journey, it has been so rewarding and gratifying personally for me that I want to be able to offer it as a service to others because there are those hidden pearls of wisdom inside each one of us. Yeah. And anybody who wishes to express should be given the opportunity to do so. So I want to be able to offer them that. So other than everything else I do, these two programs will come out. And last but not the least, um, I, uh, I will be launching uh, a podcast. And we will talk Love more that. about it. Love that. <laughs> 
I think, uh, you know, it, it would not be a podcast. I'm still finding the right word for it. Uh, but somewhere where you offer a platform to people, especially decision makers uh, within those uh, big offices, yeah. uh, people who sit and decide the fates of millions, uh, I want to be able to tap into that. So, yeah, I'll take a pause there. That's that's incredible. And I wish you all the success in everything that you're trying to achieve. This Thank you year. so and much. I, I know you'll bring it to fruition. Why is girl child education so important? Why is that a cause that's so close to your heart? You know, um, as you continue to grow in your life, Shreya, and I'm sure you have a beautiful story to tell the world as well. And one day I would love to sit and hear that as well. Uh, but as you continue to find your path forward, you know your calling right? You know there is something bigger that you have to do in order to add value. And I use the word carefully because, you know, uh, some people understand it and others, they use it as a slang, the purpose of your life, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was going through the challenges that I went through, uh, through through various, you know, upheavals, I, I realized what would give me inner content and satisfaction is to see girls getting the right level of education and having the opportunity to you know make it in their life because uh, so many killed dreams so many you know silent uh, desires so many unfulfilled uh, I do not know visions right yeah and if I can change life of even one child one child at a time uh, I think it will be all worth it so yes it was not something that I read somewhere, or it's not something that I saw somebody doing, but it was, it was from within, it was the inner calling, the inner child of me who felt when I do this is what will give me a sense of fulfilling my life's purpose. I don't even know if that's my life purpose. And if anybody who claims they know the life purpose, I would want to go and have a talk with them. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Uh, but at least it gives me a sense of that fulfillment. Uh, and if it is even one step in the right direction, then I'll give it my full shot. Yeah. Have you read Moment of Lift by Melinda Gates? No, I haven't. It talks about how important girl child education is because you educate a girl, you educate an entire family. Oh, and lovely. it's supposed to be the number one solution to even solving climate crisis. There we go. Because women are at the forefront of it and they have all the tools and solutions yes. that um, we need. You know, it's thank you for mentioning it. And I want to bring out something here. Yeah. And, and it's just happening so naturally as we're speaking, right? You should not have to read a book to know what's your calling. Yeah. Right now, when you mentioned I would pick up that book in a heartbeat because I want to read. Yeah. Now I can expand my vision, understanding who spoke about it. But my, my advice to listeners is as you are going through your life, as you're going through your challenges, see what lights you up. See what makes you happy without even you doing it. Let alone when you do it, you know, your, your light will shine. I don't know at what level. Yeah. But even if the thought of that makes you smile, makes you want to, you know, light yourself up then it's worth pursuing, right? And then, like you've just given me a direction, right? Things will show up, right? Resources will come up, directions will come, but you have to take that first step. How do you tap into that light? How do you tap into that knowing uh, and those signs that universe <laughs> is giving you without, without ignoring it, without brushing it away? Look, what I will talk today is my experience, right? And what you will experience will be completely different from mine. So uh, I am very happy to bring about, you know, my story uh, to the table here. Uh, but of course, that should not be a benchmark because spirituality or knowing or calling is not a cookie cutter approach. L like today morning when I was trying to come here, right? Yeah. I put the location on GPS. I'm sure you took a different route. You yeah. took a different vehicle. I took a different vehicle. I took a different route, but we all got to the same, same location. Point. So no the matter point, how you get there. The point I'm trying to make is there is no single way of knowing where you're going or how you will achieve that. Mm -hmm. The important part is to move, is to take the action, right? Um, and uh, my uh, my journey started around six years back when I was at my lowest. What were you going through? Uh, so, so many things, Shreya. So I was, uh, I was going through some family challenges. I was uh, making career choices which were not working out for me. Um, so I was at the helm of my career. I was the global head of human capital for a very big strategy consulting firm managing their 42 country operations, you know, uh, over 10,000 employees living uh, a dream life. And then On I the decided, yeah, yeah. yeah, 
but when I sat on the other side of the table and I looked at what I was doing to my life, I was not happy with that, right? So imagine your career is cruising at a very good altitude and here you're sitting and thinking, no, the engine is not working and the engine will crash. Uh, and I thought, you know, my career will crash and burn if I did not re-engineer my product, right? Yeah. Which is when I decided to set up the business. And uh, oh my God, oh my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am so grateful to myself for making that choice, but it came with a very, very, very huge price, right? What is the price you paid? Um, everything in terms of restarting yourself, in terms of challenging your own understanding of who you are and what you want in your life uh, to putting everything at stake uh, from you as a brand mm -hmm. to uh, your savings to uh, you know the business decisions and ideas that you have it's it's all a huge risk right yeah uh, and that to doing it in not your country right that's the hardest thing. If anyone, you will understand yeah, that, right? Yeah, that's the hardest thing. There was, there was a lot that had to be recalibrated uh, to be able to make the right choice. But hand on my heart, and again, whoever claims it otherwise, I would want to talk to them. <laughs> there, uh, you cannot ever go 100% right with such changes. It's not meant to be like that, right? Because if you know it all, then there is nothing for you to figure out and your journey should just end, right? At home, there were some disturbances. Financially, I was hurting because of the choices I was making to leave my job, set up my business. And uh, just then I was diagnosed with uh, um, uh, a medical condition which required a lot of attention. This was in 2015, so we're talking eight years eight, back, right? Years um, and I found myself rushing within 24 hours of the diagnosis to India, uh, getting into an open stomach surgery. They literally just cut me open like a book, oh all through my abs. And, uh, and, and after that, it was, it was a very difficult 24 months. Uh, of recovery uh, and healing, not just you know physically. physically. It was it was a lot of internal healing that required. So uh, I, I made my life very difficult, uh, but where I sit today, I'm very grateful for that. Right? What was that journey like, and what gave you the strength in that moment to change everything around you? Um, so I will tap into my spiritual side a bit here because um, you know. Whichever way we want to package it, I think uh, at some point we all need that anchor. And, uh, you know, one of the workshops I do for, for, for people and for my clients, corporates, is, is the 3A workshop, right? Where we speak about awareness, alignment and anchoring, right? Awareness, alignment and anchoring. And then uh, when, when I started to be aware and started to align myself, uh, and I'm so, so grateful that anchor arrived, which is in the form of my spiritual teacher. And were you ready to go on the spiritual journey? Were you spiritual before or were you, were you seeking that? Wow, that's a very deep question. You see, Shreya, I, I, was, uh, I was always spiritual. Now when I look back, right? I grew up in a household where I would wake up to the, you know, the smell of um, the Havan essence. You know, the spiritual uh, fire that we light in the house, right? Yeah. My grandmother used to do that fire ceremony every morning. When I was three years old, my mother tells me I was reciting Hanuman Chalisa, you know, back of my hand, right? So I grew up like that. I thought getting up in the morning and, you know, purifying yourself and doing a prayer, offering a prayer was spirituality. And by, by thinking and doing that, we're not even scratching the surface of understanding a subject as big as spirituality. Was that performative, practicing those rituals? Is that, was that more of a performance than an actual practice? You know, at the time when I was doing it, uh, it felt right. Mm -hmm. And I did it because I did not know any other way, mm -hmm. right? I, it's, it's like, you know, uh, somebody told you that sitting like this, doing a podcast is the best way of recording, mm -hmm. right? And you're following it. Till one day somebody will come with those invisible AI enabled microphones or whatever or a chip that goes into your ear and that will become the best way to do it. Yeah. So you do it because you do not know better. Mm. Right. And I did it because I did not know better. And also because it made me feel good. It gave me peace. It gave me tranquility in the morning. Uh, but as I continue to progress and as I continue to explore this dimension called spirituality, um, I realized that spirituality, 
how I understand it now, Shreya, in one, one sentence, is if you can be a 100% pre present in the moment, doing what you want to do in that moment, that for me is spirituality. So if I'm That's here beautiful. with you, thank you. If I'm here with you and Shreya is 100% here and Charul is 100% here and they are creating this beautiful podcast where they are 100% vested, that for me is a spiritual experience. I've never heard anyone define it that way. <laughs> okay. that's, that's beautiful. But you mean giving your 100% to anything that you're doing in the moment, whether that's your calling, whether that's your purpose, whether that's your work, you being present in the moment is a spiritual experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, people say, oh, I meditate. It's like, oh, I breathe. Can you breathe? No, it happens naturally. So you cannot meditate. Meditation happens. All you have to do is you have to be 100% in that state and it will happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sitting here looking all righteous and giving you all this gyan, I call it, right? Is, uh, is all thanks to, so going back to the story, right? Is, is when my, my teacher, my spiritual guru, my master appeared. Now, when I say appeared, it's not like I had to go to a cave and he was levitating somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was none of that. He's, uh, he's known by the name uh, Maitreya Dadashriji. And uh, he lives in India. He's a doctor by profession, a qualified doctor. And uh, he runs an organization called Maitri Bodh Parivar, which is a family of friends. Family of friends. Yes. Uh, and his purpose is to not form a cult or a followership but to give you enough wisdom that you're connected with your source and that you are empowered within yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you need help, you're not going looking outside. You're looking you internally. You find it within yourself. And we all have that, right? Mm -hmm. So his teachings allow you to tap into that. Um, so yeah, again, all the glorious story right now. <laughs> oh my God, the, the experiences Anubhav, we call it, Anubhav in Hindi, right, is, is your own journey of understanding who you are, has been nothing short of where this book comes in, right? So um, he, he appeared, uh, or let's say his name got introduced to me in 2017, Shreya. So it was at the time when all that background was happening, which yeah. I shared. Yeah. Do you call that your rock bottom, in a way? Yeah, and I, I always say it how Mel Robbins describes it, right? Oh, and I love you hit Mel your Robbins. yeah, me too. Yeah. There, there are some very interesting, uh, beautiful day-to-day uh, -day things that she creates, uh, almost like a spiritual experience, right? Yeah. So she says, when you hit your rock bottom, you know you've found something solid inside. Oh, love that <laughs> Mel Robbins magic again. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, I had hit my rock bottom at that point, and. Um, you know, my, my life is an open book. I, I was after that surgery. I, I still don't have babies. And at that time, it was like a big slap on my face, you know, on my... Did you uh, want kids? Yes, yes. I, that, is, that is something that I always wanted and yeah. dreamt of, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, my life was not serving me well. And I, I, was, I was fighting myself for it, right? I was angry. I felt like a victim. I felt deprived and I wanted to give it back to my life, uh, forgetting it's my own life and it's just me. Yeah. So I was going through various cycles of IVF and failing terribly at it, right? And uh, screwing my body in turn and it was, it was all a mess. Uh, and this was my last attempt at IVF and I was very heartbroken and I was, uh, I was, uh, I was not in a happy place, yeah? And uh, the doctors and me, we kind of had a repo and we understood what was happening. So after this last blood test, this was in Dubai, and I, my throat still dries up saying that, so excuse me. Um, she, she said, oh, yeah, your blood tests have come in, but you have to come to the clinic to, for me to talk about it. And I knew if she's calling me to the clinic is because she doesn't want to break it to me over the phone because it will be too hard and whatever. So I, I, I knew what the outcome was. I went to uh, the clinic any which way is. She broke the news, which was negative. Um, I, I was like that inconsolable child. I was weeping like a little girl in my car. And that was the day when I told my husband I just wanted to deal with it myself. So I, I drove alone and I left the clinic. I was 
I was literally sobbing and weeping and I was driving just randomly, right? I don't advise anybody to do it, but I was doing it <laughs> that day. And there came a point where my eyes were hurting and they were red and I could not even see clearly. And I said, you know, let me just stop, gather myself and then I drive back home. Um, at that point, Shreya, as well, I was going through, you know, a point of, you know, rediscovering myself, you know, that alignment was happening at some level. Yeah. So I would go on Facebook and I would say yes to every event, you know, if there was a yoga event happening anywhere, meditation <laughs> happening anywhere, you know, yeah. girls coming together, drinking cocoa, I was just going, finding myself, right? So I was parked in this random place and my phone beeps at the time. And uh, it says your event is about to start in 15 minutes. So I was literally, literally rubbing my eyes, could not even see. I opened my Facebook and I was like, what is this event? Where is it happening? Yeah. And the location of it was like 200 meters away from where I was parked. So I was like, OK, it's close it's right by. Yeah. yeah, It was a meditation session. So I called up my husband saying, look, I want to be alone any which ways. It's, it's here by chance, so I'm just going to go. It's an hour's process, and I'll see you later. You didn't want to deal with the pain of that together as a, as a couple, knowing it was such a big yeah. dream that was being taken away from, I imagine, both of you. I uh, Look, yes, the answer is yes, and uh, we did, because this was not the first time I had failed at it, right? And you'd expected that? You'd expected the response that you'd get when you went into the clinic? Yes. You saw that coming? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I knew it. Somewhere deep down, I knew it was not working out. Uh, but I was not in a place of acceptance. Uh, forget about being aware of what's happening to me. I, I was playing the victim. I wanted to fight it. I wanted to prove myself right because I always somehow was right in all my other decisions till that time. You wanted to control this as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I left my car. I walked to that place and guess where I reached? I reached to the first session of Maitri World Parikar. <laughs> <laughs> it led me there. So if my husband didn't come with me that day or I chose to go alone, it was all leading to something and I'm thankful for that. So yeah, uh, that was the day when, when I started to really tap into spirituality and understanding it from somebody who was in a state who realized what spirituality is and could explain it to me, somebody like me, somebody ignorant like me. And that's when a lot of shifts started to happen. So I'll take a pause there. You opened yourself up to that journey as well. I think that so much of that is about opening up yeah to the to science be honest, that the universe is providing to be honest no no you, <laughs> i you left that meditation and i never wanted to go back <laughs> <laughs> i'm like no 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 this is this is this is not for me you know there is a balance of scales you need mind but you also need your heart and we have put so much of weight on mind that it started to take control of not just you and me but humanity and this planet at large right and somewhere there is a balance that needs to be established yeah. in terms of who we are when we operate from the heart or mind aligned together, right? So my mind was hyperactive and it told mm. me this is not for you. And I did not go back for, I think, good six months. I didn't want to go really? back. Really? You didn't go back for six months? I was like, no, no, no. I did not experience anything. Mm. It was a waste of time. I was vulnerable. You know how your mind plays with you? Yeah. So I had enough reasons to validate my action and my yeah. mind was helping me. Were you not ready to sit with yourself and your inner voice and to have those conversations no. that you know no. were going to come out no. of that? What were you afraid of? Say again? What were you afraid of? Everything. I could not look myself in the mirror. I did not like what I saw. I did not like myself because uh, I was just focusing on my physical self. Like I said, I'd put on so much weight and uh, I was losing hair with steroid. And oh, oh my God, I was I was in a terrible state and I, I did not want to look at myself. I stopped meeting people because uh, I felt embarrassed of who I'd become. Um, and I was literally, you know, building those walls around me. And every time something would happen, I would lay another layer and make it higher. So I almost kind of disappeared in my own world, doing no good to myself, right? I relate to that more than you think I do, and I've never opened up about this. But there was a time 
in 2018 where I was diagnosed with depression, ADHD and anxiety at the same time. And I, had, I was going through something at home as well. Mm. And I'd put on so much weight. And I used to get all of these comments. Of course, you know, people body shame you yes. at that point. But yes. they think it's about food and it's about lack of discipline. But there's so much mental health involved yes. Yes. with how your body looks and how yeah. you feel about it. Yes that um, I don't think anyone else understands that yeah, on, I on, do. The, on the surface. Yeah, yes. so I remember going through those exact moments where I didn't, I, I stopped taking photos. I stopped, you know, being active on social media. I stopped posting because I didn't want to be photographed. I didn't want people to look at me. You yes. somehow, you know, you want to become invisible and not yes. be not be seen. Yes. So if there wasn't a table, I'll jump and hug you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we can do I, that I after this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending you a virtual hug. <laughs> Same. I, I, I feel it. Definitely yeah. feel it. So yeah. I, I understand exactly what you how you must have felt in that in that yes. moment what was that self-love journey like for you because you said you didn't like who you yeah. saw mm. in the mirror mm. how did you start falling in love with that person again um so like i said i will give a huge credit and uh, lots of gratitude to my spiritual teacher dada shriji uh, because he enabled me to make those changes for myself right but it required um, a lot of forgiveness because Forgiving I was yourself uh, and and so Others. yeah you, you you've re very rightly said that's the most important piece because we think we have to forgive everybody else and we forget that we have to forgive ourselves for being so hard on ourselves right yeah so for me there was there was a big thing but you know you, you must have heard of this, right? If you carry all this monkey on your shoulder, how will you ever feel light, right? Yeah. So I had to let go of all those monkey on my shoulder, monkeys on my shoulder, and there were many of them. I think there was a hill up there. <laughs> <laughs> what were these monkeys doing? What were they saying to you? Why were they holding you back? Uh, they were not holding me back. I was keeping them with me. I was feeding them every day bananas, and they were very happy being around me. So it was all, it was all on me nobody else whoever so so if we unpack this whoever has hurt you they have done that in their state of consciousness because they feel that's right they have moved on because they are operating at a different level yeah. here you are where you're trying to rediscover yourself and do right by yourself and you realize oh my god this person did bad to me yeah. and by holding on to that thought I'm letting them control my life from here onwards. You still have that power over you. Yes. Even after it's done. Maybe it yes. was done years ago. Maybe it was done months ago. But you still carry yes. and lock that around. Sometimes lifetimes, right? But who are we hurting but ourselves? Mm. And, you know, a lot of people talk about it. But very little do something about it. And my shout out to anybody who's listening to this is, is to do something about it. If you do not know how to do it, call me. But do something about it, right? You have to let those monkeys go. Stop feeding them bananas, right? Otherwise, they'll come right back and they'll call their friends too. Mm, that's true. Right? There's something so comforting about being in a state of just throwing a pity party to yourself yeah. and just reveling in that every single yes. day. Yes. Why is self-pity such a state of safety and comfort and why is it so hard to come out of that? Okay. Why is it so easy to be a victim and hold that narrative? Sure. Even after you should let that, even after you yeah. need to let that go. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And the answer that I'm getting right now is when you cut yourself and you ooze blood, if you were to look at your body and say, why are you oozing blood? It's so, it's so gross. Don't do that. It's like you're asking your body to behave against its true nature right so when you go through a challenging experience and you feel pity for yourself is because that's your natural behavior so my advice is do not fight it right let it let it happen to you because the more you fight it the more you want to do it right the best advice or the best uh, lesson that i've learned for myself is to flow with it but do not get dragged into that flow right mm -hmm. so if you feel pity for yourself feel that let it happen. Be aware that I'm feeling pity over myself or over what has happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel sorrow. I feel grief. I feel like a victim. Experience that emotion because good and bad, all the emotions are here and they were all given to us to experience it, yeah. right? Experience it, but do not make that your truth. Do not start to identify to it. That is not who you are. You felt like that in that moment. That is not Shreya. Shreya had an emotion, but Shreya is who she is, right? 
So um, first advice, do not fight it. Because the more you fight, the stronger it will come. And, and I'll share a little example of that. Is, uh, I told you about my 2015 surgery, right? And all the beautiful things that happened after that. My learning was not over, Shreya. And um, somewhere there was a big lesson to be learned. So fast forward to 2021. Okay, and this is around June, July. And uh, my condition, because of which I was operated, started to surface back. Uh, which was even very, after you were operated. Yes, yes, it it, it came back, um, and uh, one thing led to another, and I found myself with an even worse diagnosis this time. It was uh, it was almost uh, a borderline ovarian cancer di- diagnosis, and I literally again in twenty four hours packed up and left for India yeah. to go to my doctor, and this time um, I, I have to say this, uh, and I say it with all humility. I thought my days are done. Because having survived what I survived in 2015, I I just did not have the courage to go through that again, right? And because the diagnosis was worse, I was like, I do not know how will I come out of that operation theater this time. Um, So I landed in India and uh, thankfully um, was was treated by the best doctors uh, available. And uh, they took really good care of me through the surgery. This time it was nine hours long. And uh, it was a very complex surgery and uh, a lot had to be done. Um, So, yeah, I I came back to senses. I opened my eyes and I was obviously in a lot of pain. And I saw my husband tearing up next to me. And it was uh, soon after COVID. So, you know, nobody was allowed to visit. So it was just me and my poor husband. (laughs) Isolating. Yes, yes. It was hard, right? Nobody could come and see you or whatever. And uh, I remember holding his hand and, and I told him, uh, both tearing up and I'm tearing up right now I don't know why I've said it a few times but uh, I said if my God or my teacher or whoever in the universe loves me and is putting me through this challenge again that means uh, I will be rewarded for enduring this pain I have to finish a learning and this time I want to do it for once and for all and Shreya that for me was my aha moment Because after that, something in me shifted. I think that big learning that had to happen Mm. had happened. Do you need a tissue? (laughs) (laughs) Do we both need tissues? Uh, (laughs) I I have to say this. I've shared this story a few times, but I've I've never felt it so emotionally. I think it's your presence or it's our connection, whatever it is. And uh, I'm I'm tearing up. I, I came back to Dubai, you know, almost recovering after a very, very complex surgery. Yeah. And, uh, other masters appeared, other help arrived. I got introduced to pranic healing mm. and how pranic healing helped me recover uh, after the surgery. Mm. It was miraculous. My, my operating doctor was surprised at my recovery and um, the, <laughs> the pageant manager was mm. calling me since August, right? And with whatever was going on in my life, it was so private and it was so quick. I, I was not sharing it with anyone, anybody. You weren't open then. about it not, back then? Not yet. I was yeah. still figuring out what, what yeah, just happened course. to me, right? So um, when I came back to Dubai after the surgery, to be honest, I was in a place where I just wanted to feel like a woman, if that makes sense. What, what did that mean? What did that mean for you? Back then? I mean, just surviving a surgery where you were diagnosed for an ovarian cancer. Thankfully, there was no cancer. Uh, it was non-malignant, um, so somebody up there was taking care of me. Yeah. But there was there was a lot that I went through, and my my chances of ever getting pregnant were were diminishing. And I had been through a lot, and I just wanted to I just wanted to feel good about myself. So I told my husband, uh, "Look, my odds of even being accepted in the pageant is is minimal, but I'll <laughs> ask them anyways, because they 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 followed up with me for how many ever times, right?" And I also remember when I was still in the hospital recovering, their phones would ring, right? From and the pageant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I used to laugh at my husband. I was like, I can't even lift my finger. My hemoglobin <laughs> is so low. They mm. think I'll... I say Ram this. fog. Yeah. yeah. I dress up like a doll and walk the ram. <laughs> it's not happening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, Two uh, different realities. Yes, yes. But life had different plans, Shreya. All I, all I did was I just followed my heart there, right? So I was like, I will just dress up get some good pictures, feel good about myself, like, you know, reclaiming myself. So even if it's just that, I will... So without any expectations, without end results, without focusing on what would come out of it. 
And the pageant team actually briefed me. They made me sign a non-disclosure saying, you know, you're coming at the last minute. So it was, I think, eight or nine days before the actual pageant. So the photo shoots were done. The dress rehearsals were done. They did some trainings and calendar shoots. I had missed on all of that, right? They're like, you can come and participate. We can't do anything additional. So I was like, yeah, I just, I just want to be a part of it. And one thing led to another, and I brought the crown home. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Thank you. Was that a reward in some way? Do you see it as a sign of reward for whatever you'd gone through? Absolutely. In I that see it short no span of time. What did that mean? What did winning that crown mean for you? <sighs> I think in a way I reclaimed Charul back, who, who was all beaten up, who was uh, missing her confidence, which she always had. Uh, somebody who who was a go-getter, somebody who was the bright kid in the family, who always did right by others. So, but, but my life in those four or five years just took me off the track completely. And bringing that crown home or just even, you know, looking at myself in the pictures, even now when I look at pictures sometimes and I see that crown on my head, the first question is, what did I ever do to, you know, to, to deserve it? <laughs> really? You have imposter syndrome? Do you, do you feel that way? Sometimes. I'm only human, right? Yeah. Uh, especially after going through what I was going through at that stage in 2021. 20, uh, mm. uh, but it's, it's a beautiful reminder that, you know, we, we all deserve to be crowned. So finish your learnings and the crown will come home. That's beautiful. And very, of course, very well deserved, even if you thank questioned you. it. Thank you. Thank even you. if it was just a testament to everything you'd been through at that point. Yes. Yes. Even if it came in the form of a beauty pageant. It was not something that I had on my vision board. It was not something that I had planned for. Um, circumstances led me to that. I accepted it. Uh, I gave it my best without any expectation. And there it is. Right. So, so I, I say it in my workshops, do you want to live with the fear of discipline or the fear of failure? What it is, you, you choose your fear, mm. uh, your fear of failing or your fear of trying, yeah. right? You choose your heart as well. You yes. choose what is yes. hard right now, what is hard yes. later. And absolutely, you right? if you pick instant gratification, you're just picking the harder hard for, Correct. Correct. for later. Correct. And again, you know, choosing your fears, those monkeys on your back, you choose who you want to feed. And then you decide which path you want to take. Uh, and again, you know, I'm sharing today all beautiful things about my life here. But, you know, I made wrong choices as well. I have, I have been wrong with my decisions. I have been wrong with people who I trusted. Uh, but it's all a part of your journey. If everything was going right all the time, what's the joy in it anyways, right? What has been, was Dubai on your vision board ever? No. <laughs> no. Because you come from India. You yes. Come, do you come from a small town in India or where in yes, India? Yes, yes, yes. From the north of India. Okay. Yeah. What has that journey been like from a small town in India to Dubai to <laughs> Mrs. UA International? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, born in a city called Kanpur in Uttar Pradesh, yeah. uh, in the north of India. Uh, I was always that girl in the family. Uh, I was I was the middle child. I have an elder sister and a younger brother, so I had that middle child syndrome, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would always get those clothes from my sister because she yeah. was growing up faster than I was at some point. Yeah. And uh, my brother, the the boy child, uh, you know, a little disclaimer. My parents they loved all three of us equally. equally okay. All this assessment is is my own doing. <laughs> <laughs> I take full credit of it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I was always that child. I was sick as a child. I was, I was not a very uh, healthy child. I, I struggled uh, as, as a little girl with, with one thing or the other. But I remember uh, being, being that child who was always uh, hustling, who was always disrupting. Mm -hmm. Very unlike who people thought I was. I was this uh, timid, very well disciplined, uh, very quiet would you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Child. I'm glad that's changed. Uh, <laughs> but I always, I was a go-getter. Uh, I was, uh, I was always first in my class. I was great in my studies. Oh, same. Yeah. 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 High, high achiever. Definitely high yes, achiever. Yes. Yes. And, and, and dreamer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was the first 
a child in the whole colony, if not in the whole family, who traveled to Mumbai. So I got selected to study in uh, ho- in Institute of Hotel Management. I did my hotel management from Mumbai, Dada Catering College. Wow. Was that what you wanted to do? You wanted no. to get into? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> my mother made me fill some forms after 12th. I wanted yeah. to be an IATN. So I was preparing for IIT. No way. Uh, not knowing what I wanted, but yeah. I was so good in maths and science. It looked like the only option at that time, right? So my mother was not very happy about that. Uh, she did not want me to grow up like a geeky nerd. So she made me fill up some forms, which I did not even know. I was just signing the forms, right? And I thank her forever for doing that. <laughs> So the next thing I remember, I got a call from Mumbai to join uh, the IHM Institute in Mumbai. I finished my three-year program there in hotel management. I worked with the Oberoi's and I flew with Jet Airways for a bit as a crew. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) year and a half. uh, Enjoyed it. Did not like my job. I knew I would not like it. No, because in terms of creativity, there was zilch, nada, nothing. You're only doing veg and non-veg meals, short sector flights. It was a domestic flight at that time, right? So, and, and like I said, I was I was a dreamer. I wanted to do more. I wanted to learn more, grow more. What was more. the biggest dream you had back then? What was the biggest dream that younger Charul ever dreamt? To leave a legacy. I did not know what it would look like. How would I create it? I did not have any answers or resources, Shreya. Uh, no answers, no resources, and everything against, you know, all, all circumstances against you. But I knew I I wanted people to remember me for doing something good. I wanted to leave a legacy. Now, what that looks like... You didn't know that? No, 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 no. To be honest, I'm still a work in progress. I, I still am figuring things out, right? So, yeah, after JET, I got an opportunity to uh, work with the Marriott uh, in the Caribbean islands. So I flew <laughs> all the way to the Caribbean. My family hated my guts. My parents were, were sad, but I wanted to do it. So they let me. And I'm very grateful to, to my parents. They there was allowed support, me. There was family support yes, yes. wherever you wanted to go. Yes, yes. They made travel. Me. Yes, they allowed me to make my mistakes. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Were there any gender expectations to this? Or do you see gender expectations to women or girls not being allowed to, you know, to travel, to study mm-hmm. abroad, to mm-hmm. work abroad, mm-hmm. for that matter? Do you see those gender expectations? Um, I will answer this in two ways. Yeah. One is how I understood it. And one, how the world made, made me see it. Mm-hmm. Right. How I understood it is, and thanks to my parents, who, who never let such a feeling come upon us at all in the household, right? Um, the three kids in the family and the extended family, the cousins or relatives, whoever would come and visit, I, as a little girl, never felt the need to even think about it because I never felt uh, discriminated is a very strong word, distinguished, or you know, made to feel like I am a different child than my brother, for example, right? You never had that lens growing up. It was never, no. it was never made apparent to you. No, no. Um, and that's a gift. I think it that's is. a gift in it itself. Is. It is. You're right. Yeah. And then the other thing is, uh, you know, the way you asked the question, I think it was a perfect timing when I said I traveled, you know, seven seas yeah. and I went to the Caribbean. Because that's when I realized, aha, uh-huh, the world doesn't see me doing things the way I see me doing things, which is if a boy can, you know, travel and do whatever mm. why can't a girl because I had few relatives of mine call me and ask me questions which made me introspect a bit mm. like oh your mom allowed you to do that and I was like why wouldn't she right oh but uh, your elder sister she got married very young and you're doing all of this don't you want to get married and you know you start to start so that was the first time process. you questioned that like should I be thinking about marriage should I yes. be allowed to travel yes that was the first time that ever yes Yes. So that concept of um, not gender bias, but inequality in a way, mm. uh, established or started to get defined in my persona for the first time when I took that long flight away from home. Uh, and mind you, we do not come from, you know, a super uber uh, level family. We were a middle class family, right? Mm. And to your question, it's a very common uh, discussion in a household. I was kept away from it, uh, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as I continued to understand life better, 
coming out of my own cocoon, I realize it's almost um, it's almost something that they're born with. Yeah. <laughs> the girl child in the family and yeah. they have to they have to accept it for lack of a better word. Uh, resenting is not an option. Fighting it uh, is questionable. Yeah. So you just start to live that life that somebody else defines for you, if you may, right? And it takes a lot to go against that. Yeah, I, I don't know if going against is going to help, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it's more about a societal change, a mind shift, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not an easy task. It's a tall order. But doing something like this today, you know, kudos to you. Um, you know, in, in, in the keynotes that I deliver around the world, I very happily accept topics around gender equality, mm-hmm. about mindset, sh- mindset shifts, uh, mental health, well-being, self-help, right? And all of those beautiful topics. Because um, there is more that needs to be said and done about these things than it has uh, in the past. And now is a good time to talk about it because people are listening. Yeah. Do you see a difference in those conversations in India and UAE? Uh, comparing the two landscapes yeah um it's like apples and oranges right Mm -hmm. Uh, but each in their own way Mm -hmm. have progressed phenomenally right Mm -hmm. i mean uae i am i'm so blessed we are all so blessed to be a part of this beautiful community we call home or extended home i mean where in the world did they have a ministry of tolerance Mm -hmm. two years back for the first time ever Mm -hmm. known or heard you know, in the mankind, was a ministry of tolerance set in UAE. Um, what does in, that department do? So it it's the purpose of the department of that ministry is to make UAE a more tolerant community, a more tolerant country. Uh, and and tolerance, I think, is a beautiful word when we talk about gender imbalance, inequality, discrimination. It kind of puts it in a dark light. Yeah. Tolerance is very positive. So we as a community, we embrace who we are. We embrace culture differences. Um, And and I I remember I I had the privilege of having a private audience with uh, Sheikh Nayan, the minister at the time of Minister of Tolerance. And his vision and his his goal uh, through that ministry was phenomenal. So very, very happy to be here experiencing that. You were telling me about Jet Airways. Yes. Oh wow. The, <laughs> Let's go the, back there. The story from yes. Jet Airways coming from his, coming from Kanpur in India yes. to the skyscraper city of Dubai. What is what has that been like? So yeah. Um, so I landed in the Caribbean, and that's when all the gender discussions started, right? Uh, but I worked f- with the Marriott for two and a half years. Uh, my family was, and I was, to be honest, we felt the distance, you know, doing the damage. Uh, because back in the day, you had to hop three, four different flights to get to Mumbai. There were no direct flights, right? And the time difference was day and night. So after two years, and it was also such a laid back life. I loved it. <laughs> but 200,000 people. Life. Yeah. Uh, so if you wanted to grow, you had to wait for somebody to retire, right? And I, <laughs> I did not have that time. So that's when Dubai happened to me. In Dubai, I wanted to come back closer to home, but not necessarily in India. Because I I grew up there, I knew that market, so I wanted to explore. And very beautifully, Dubai happened. I got an opportunity to come and work here. Uh, I first landed here in 2003, and then everything else is history. Uh, in between, I, I took a break, uh, a few breaks, actually. I went and I studied in the UK, did my master's there. Uh, then when I got married, I took a break in 2011 uh, to go and live with my husband in India before we both moved here. And then I also went and lived in Canada for a couple of years. Was uh, that difficult for him to make the move to Dubai, to be where you are and to oh, support? Believe me, I will let him speak for himself. <laughs> 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 Look, he visited me several times uh, before we got married. And we both uh, mutually agreed that this is the place we wanted to call home. So I'm sure he saw things uh, which aligned with him and the future that we wanted to build together. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, that's beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Because it, there's just some sort of gender assumption that you move to wherever you know, yes. your husband is, especially when there's not even a question yes. of discussion. Uh, <laughs> so I, I love that he supported you. No, I think you know. who I am today and the way I position myself and the way I've been able to achieve 
whatever I've been able to achieve. I give immense, immense credit, uh, very socially, very publicly to my to my darling husband. Um, we've come a long, long way. We are married for 12 years now. And the first six years were, were, were very difficult. Uh, but uh, all those challenges have led us to a place where we understand each other now. And, you know, writing book and being here and running my business, uh, our business. We both co-founded the business. Oh, you run it together. Yes. Could you believe I have to write a book on that? <laughs> you do. Couples you do because they say don't, don't mix relationship and business and don't mix love and um, Who says that, business Shreya? together. Who that's, says that? I mean, that's what I've heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're clearly proving that wrong. Uh, there are days when I want to go back to them and say, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is a mix of... It is. I think it's how, how you build that relationship, how you define that narrative for yourself, right? Um, but yeah, going back to what I was saying, I'm so grateful. He's my silent supporter. And um, so many ways in which he has helped me, you know, come out and shine. Uh, and has been there, you know, through my surgeries, through my my times of crisis and chaos where I, I did not want to even see anybody, let alone my own self in the mirror. He's He's been through that with me. And I'm so, so, so grateful. I think uh, it always helps to have that support at home. Yeah, definitely. What does having a supportive partner do for a woman in terms of her career, in terms of her growth, in terms of success and how far she can go as well? Wow, that's that's a very difficult question. Yeah, um, I I think uh, I will be. It will be inappropriate of me to say how far can you go. It will have to be one's own journey. Uh, but to say you can do it all alone is a myth. I can say that with a hand on my heart. Right, the more we lean on, the more we can be vulnerable. The more we can leverage. Uh, that's that's the way to be. We as humans were created to live and thrive in a community, not isolate ourselves and prove each other right or wrong, mm -hmm. right? Or who is greater and better than the other. Yeah. The whole essence of humanity is community, right? Now, define community, define your tribe. Your tribe could be just that friend that you meet every day. That's fine. That's your community, right? Mm -hmm. Your community or your tribe or people you vibe with mm -hmm. could be your, your husband and your kids. And that's fine, too. It could be, you know, you're a single mother and you live with your parents and that's your community, yeah. right? And I say this again and again, and I've said this a few times already in our conversation. Do not let somebody else's truth be your truth. Define your own happy, define your own, you know, truth. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you will set examples or perhaps shine the light upon a different way of living for somebody else who is seeking an answer. Because everybody looks up to somebody, yeah. right? And why are we doing this? Because we want people to, to learn from our experiences, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but for me to say this is the only way to do it is, is, is absurd. Mm -hmm. If anybody says that, I think there is, there is room for dialogue there, right? Mm -hmm. So go with your own experience, but, but find a way of leaning on. Because I think that is extremely, extremely important. Not only when you're sad, but also when you're happy. Yeah. Right? Somebody who pushes you forward. Somebody you can pull along with you. Somebody who nudges you. Mm -hmm. You know? Somebody who offers you that hand when you need it the most. Absolutely. I think we have to learn to ask for help as well. It's okay Absolutely. to, like you said, lean on other people. And we're so afraid of asking for yes. help. Yes. Yes. That the sense of community and needing people you know when you need them and also offering that in return is so so important and yeah have you felt that in the startup community have you felt that in the UAE yeah. do you have um, yeah. other female founders around you is there is there a web of them in yes. in Dubai supporting you as well be smart not foolish right mm -hmm. what I mean by that is as you continue to grow your network you will come across people because that's them yeah. that's not you who would want to take advantage, who would steal ideas, who would, uh, you know, talk back about you and whatever it is that they do, right? And that's fine. You know, rainbow has seven colors. If you miss a color, it's not a rainbow, right? So when you meet people, you'll meet all kinds of people. But you have to, so like I said, you have to be smart, not, not foolish. 
uh, smart in terms of who do you want to define as your tribe? Who do you want to share what you want to share with, right? And there is a lot that comes through experience, right? So be discerning and filter yes. people out. Yes, but it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. If you decide to call somebody a friend who after six months or six years, you said, oh, what the hell was I thinking? Mm -hmm. It's okay because perhaps you both had some learning to finish together. Mm -hmm. So take it with a pinch of salt. Remember the good times and move on. Don't, don't stay there. Mm -hmm. And definitely do not want to venge it off with anyone because it will not take you anywhere positive yeah how do you balance wanting to do more to be more successful to be more ambitious to create more opportunities with spirit the spiritual side of you which is i have enough i am enough i've done enough and i'm really content with where i am is that is there a trade-off wow again a very big <laughs> and a very deep question Look, um, I go through that trade-off or that dialogue with myself every single living moment of my life, right? It's like, okay, I've written three books or how many ever books, but I have this urge and I'm almost on the way of writing two more books, right? Um, so I think what, what keeps me sane is understanding the value out of it, right? The value for myself and the value for others right if me wanting to do more it's 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 not like a rat race right because i'm i'm running against myself right am i going to crash and burn doing what i'm doing or i'm going to see how it adds value to my journey and to those around me and i think that definition of value for me is over the time become very very instrumental um, otherwise it's just another book or it's just another trophy um, and I'm telling you, it will give you no contentment, no peace, no joy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to feel that joy and that contentment doing what you do, define how that adds value to you and to the community that you, that you live in. So what is the balance between ambitious and being content? So contentment is, this is my definition of it, right? So my definition of contentment is fulfilling the value out of whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. And then ambition is wanting to do it better the next time. So if I've written a book mm -hmm. and I feel I've added value to myself, to my spiritual journey, mm -hmm. and it helps or it serves as a, as a, a guide or a self-help tool to others, mm -hmm. I have fulfilled the value of that task. My ambition is to write the next book, which is better than my first. So you're only competing with yourself and no one else. Uh, if I if I achieve that state, I think I can leave everything and go to the Himalayas. <laughs> 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 and I don't even want to start to believe I've reached there. <laughs> I'm only a human. Uh, I, I, I set bold targets for myself. Um, so if it's a book, I want to work upon making it a best selling book, yeah. right? Uh, if it's a workshop that I've delivered for 20 people, I want to not deliver it for 200 people, ensuring that the value gets delivered, right? Um, but yes, I think it's always helpful to have a benchmark. And, uh, you know, giving all the wisdom I'm giving you today to learn from others, lean on, leverage, that's where the competition or, um, you know, those who are doing better than yourselves, they come in. So I think uh, we, we need to be wise enough to understand what's happening in the market, who's doing what in terms of your business stream or your area of work. Uh, and there's always a thing or two to learn from each other. I've learned a lot from, from other people who have written books or, you know, who do podcasts like yourself <laughs> and, uh, you know, who have gone through what they've gone through in their life. So I spend a lot of time meeting new people, networking, uh, because there's a lot of strength in the right network. And uh, I think I skipped the question when you asked about, you know, Dubai, if it has a good startup ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. It does uh, in terms of the support of setting up your business and all of that. Mm -hmm. But also there's been a huge shift of women leaving their jobs or who are new mums and, you know, they took a break and now have a calling of doing something on their own. So there are a lot of budding entrepreneurs in the market. I actually coach uh, quite a few of them yeah. in terms of their journey becoming an entrepreneur. What can we do to bring more women on the table where decisions are being made, where investments are being made? 
How do we support them? Look, uh, if we look into an organization, like a grain of an organization, how many women make it to the board level? You and I know it's less than 10%, yes. right? When you look at a family level, let's say an Asian household, right? How many women are allowed to make decisions for their kids and their family and their businesses? Perhaps less than 5%, yes. right? And if you go to different other parts of the world, those numbers, they vary, right? So there's definitely room for improvement, right? I think we as individuals need to define how we can enable that. If it disturbs you, what can we do to improve it? So somebody like myself, right? You talk to me on a podcast, I'll bring it up. You put me on a stage, I'll bring it up. You ask me to write a book, I'll bring it up, right? You ask me to deliver a workshop, I'll bring it up. Because a change will only happen through dialogue. You have to somewhere, st- because it's all here, Shreya. If your mind is not thinking in the direction, you will not implement a change. That's true. And that is true to every human being, a government official, uh, you know, a homemaker, um, a budding entrepreneur, whichever way we want to slice and dice it, right? Um, the important thing is to talk about it, bring awareness about it, and create channels and opportunities for them to do something. Because you and I have platforms to talk about it. The others are sitting and wondering, how do I make, take that first step, right? Yeah. So going back again to what I started the conversation with is, you know, education is the foundation of bringing about a societal change in mindset, right? Yeah. And I want to be able to achieve that through my foundation, yeah. uh, especially for girl child. Yeah. If from their childhood they know that they can dream big and they can bring about a change, they do not have to be that cookie cutter like their mother lived their life, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not good or bad. I'm sure she had a very fulfilling life, Mm -hmm. but perhaps that's not their choice. Allow them to choose. So yes, it's not going to be a significant change today or tomorrow, Mm -hmm. but we have to find our own way of wanting to bring that change and do it more than a lip service. How do we go about creating those opportunities, building those channels, educating whether that's whether it's in the government space, whether it's in the startup space, whether it's in the investment space, mm-hmm. accelerators, mm-hmm. or even companies for that matter when it comes to hiring and recruiting? Mm-hmm. How do we go about shifting these different landscapes if you want to touch upon them? Sure. So if you look, let's take example of UAE, right? So if you see there is all, so at a government level, mm-hmm. they have made provisions, right? of bringing women into different areas of you know decision making be it at a ministry level be it at a board level be it at any level right mm-hmm. there are there are mandates that they have to meet so one way of bringing about a changes is creating or defining a protocol and mandating it mm-hmm. right in which case you know it's a bell curve kind of an approach mm-hmm. that those many men these many women everybody gets an opportunity have and that really shouldn't have that set yes yeah the other way of approaching it is is <laughs> really understanding what it is that they want to do mm-hmm. right so um there, there are many accelerator programs here right depending on your area of work so you know dubai accelerator programs they help you fund your startups they help you um with uh, raising equity for your business. Uh, They help you with um, the coaches that can guide you and mentor you through the first three or five years. So all that help is provided, right? And I I have to say this because it's, it's, it's no better way to say it. Let this work also start at a household level. Yes. Right? Because if the government is giving you all those opportunities and they're not takers for it, then it's a decision worth reconsidering, right? Mm -hmm. So at a household level, how we are bringing up our kids, how are we telling them what it is for them when they grow up? Mm -hmm. Uh, For a mother to know that, you know, raising the children is not the only purpose of her life (laughs) or that, you know, if she wants to do something from home, like there's so many entrepreneurs within each household in India, uh, whether it's your father, your brother, your your mother, your siblings, even your extended cousin, right? Who enables you to bounce off those ideas, who allows you to dream big, right? Sometimes, uh, and most of the times for me, it has been my own self, right? You took on that role for yourself. That is my home, yeah. really. Yeah. I, I had to come home. And I, I want to drive this point across to the listeners as well, that it's it's good to leverage lean on and all of that but if if 
in an unfortunate circumstance where you cannot have somebody who understands where you are, you know you have a home to go to. And believe me, you will get the answers, right? Yeah. So as much as I, I, you know, really, really appreciate my husband, my brother, my, my, my parents who have helped me on different occasions of my life, yeah. I really had to go home to my own self to figure out what it is that I want to do. It, it, it's, I'll use an analogy, right? So if you, if you want to make or paint uh, a beautiful masterpiece, right? Um, somebody, let's say your brother, knows which pencil would be great to sketch this, right? Yeah. Let's say your father tells you these colors will look very bright. Mm -hmm. Your mother comes and says, hey, this canvas size is beautiful. But if you do not know what you want to paint, all their advice on which crayon to use, which colors to choose, what size of uh, the canvas, how does it matter? Yeah. So knowing what painting you want to paint is you knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. And easier said than done, but if you crack that code, yeah. that's where the beauty, beauty lies. And that's, that's going to be your aha moment. I'm still figuring that out. When you say that, I'm still figuring that out because it's so important to sit with yourself and ask and know what is it that you want to do? What is mm. it that you really want without the external noise, without the you know, external validation or seeking support, seeking advice? Because I think all of that will fall flat if you don't know mm. the knowing, if you mm. don't know the calling. And that first step is probably the hardest step to take. Yes. Because so many people dreams dreams for you. So yes. many people have this blueprint and the story laid out for yes. you that yes. you're supposed, this is the path that you're supposed to walk on. And for you to say no to that and for you to just stick true to who you are and something that is calling you, I think that also takes a lot of courage. Yes. It takes a lot of work. Yes. And I think I'm, I'm at a place where I'm also still figuring that, yes. figuring that out. And yes. that doesn't, I don't think that comes easy. One, it will not come easy. I will tell you that. And two, it's uh, it's an ongoing process mm -hmm. because uh, the moment you think you're enough, that's where the decline begins, right? So it's not wanting to get better and better and acquire more and more, mm -hmm. but it's always wanting to finish one learning and move on to the next because that really is the purpose of your life. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said it. <laughs> 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 How I understand anyone's purpose in life yeah. without... Uh, quantifying or measuring it up or defining any boundaries around it. Mm -hmm. The purpose of one's life is to fulfill the learnings that we have carved out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you have finished a few learnings, and I'd like to believe I have finished a few learnings, I think there is more to come, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some may call it challenges, the other call it learnings. The third person might, you know, spell it out in a different way. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 like if a train has reached a station and has nowhere to go what do you do with that train mm. <laughs> the yeah. journey continues right yeah. what have been the three biggest lessons you've gotten out of the hardest part of your life that you went through truth does not mind being questioned but a lie does not like being challenged that's i love that <laughs> i love that thank you Thank you. That was number one. Yes, because yeah. I had to I had to define I had to be true to myself. I had to define what my truth was. And I also had to make sure that I was not accepting any lies from no one, even myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the other uh, very, very important lesson is define your own happy. Right. And I've said my recent post talks about it. Right. Uh, and, and, I, and I've actually written it like that, you know, the sun will continue to rise and, you know, the wind will flow and, you know, the waves will rise and fall. Mm -hmm. So there are things which are which are consistent. They're happening very naturally. The phenomena is beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. But something in them is changing. Mm -hmm. Right. So they are happy in that state where the sun just rises and sets. It does That's not want to come flow. and party with you. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what gives you contentment? What is your flow? What gives you happiness? What makes you lit, you know? You have to define that for yourself. And with that, the caveat here is it could change from different phases of your life. If you are a mother right now, seeing your child happy is what gives you happiness. Yeah. When that, that bird has flown off the nest, yeah. define your happy then. If you're still sticking to that happy, you're calling for trouble. Yes. And the third that's coming to me is... Um, if you have to change the fruit, you have to fix the root, right? Mm -hmm. So if you really want your outcomes to be any different, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to invest in that inner work. Mm -hmm. 
and that inner work that has done wonders for me is is having a morning routine having the me time so for me uh, meditation in the morning is non-negotiable uh, my yoga and my my time for myself is non-negotiable uh, my time to introspect and write what it is that I want to do in the next quarter next week whatever which, whichever is your timeline all that is super super critical so yeah those would be my three advices that's solid advice. Thank you. <laughs> solid fact advice from everything you've learned over everything you've been through. Thank you. As well. I want to touch upon sustainability, environment, metiti, green, because that's also... It's, sure. it's metiti. Matiti. Right? Ma- matiti? Matiti, yeah. Matiti. Yeah. What, what does that mean? So uh, when me and my husband, we co-founded Matiti Group, uh, we wanted to um, we wanted to go old school. We wanted to find a word mm-hmm. that kind of uh, resonates with our vision of the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Matiti is from Vedas uh, in India, okay. and it means being in multiple states at one time, at the same time. Wow. So you can be here, but you can also be there. And the world was not in that wave of sustainability. But Vikrant and I were at a point where we wanted to diversify our portfolio further. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to, you know, have the foresight of becoming a carbon neutral ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And we set up Matiti Green. And to be honest, it was so timely. Because as soon as we set it up, the whole world was at that time starting to talk about green. When was this? Uh, must have been end of 2018, okay. early 2019. Yeah. Which when was, sustainability was just taking people off. People were starting to wake yeah. up. Yes, yeah. yes. So we were ready, right? Mm. Um, so under sustainability, you know, when we, even we started, and you know, this is the coaching that we provide to organizations as well. Sustainability is, is everything other than environment. And a lot what of do you us mean other don't, than environment? because everybody thinks we plant trees and that's sustainability. Mm. You know, even if you just read the UN SDGs, it gives you a sense and understand how holistic it is, right? Yeah. But uh, for a layman, right, sustainability is all about carbon sequestration, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, I'm forgetting who did the polls. It must have been Deloitte or the EY. Mm. And, you know, to kind of understand what sustainability meant to... Uh, you know, a layman. Yeah. And it was, I think it was over 80% responses all around environment initiatives. So I think we as a community first need to understand what sustainability is, yeah. right? How do you define it? I think uh, it's it's the way of conducting yourself where you look out for yourself and others. It's simple. So if you are working or doing some project with environment, it's looking out for your benefit, but also the benefit of, of the environment. If it's about working with uh, women uh, and men, then how do you create a sustainable culture where both of them thrive together and learn together, right? If it's about offering employment opportunities to you know those families in the rural areas, mm-hmm. how do we do that by ensuring when I benefit from a project? Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, our tree project, right? When we plant these trees in the rural areas and these farmers who look after those trees, we do not claim the crop. So whatever, if it's a fruit bearing tree, mm-hmm. the fruit is for them. So it supports their livelihood, right? So creating shared value as well. And that is sustainability for me, yeah. right? Uh, but just by planting tree and you know helping sequester carbon and then I'm printing, I don't know, boxes of pages in my office, or I'm hopping on a plane to, you know, first class to go wherever, how am I enabling a sustainable future for myself or others, right? So it's the it's the holistic understanding of what sustainability is all about, right? It's like doing a, a big sustainability event, and we still have those printed cards for everybody who's coming in. Yeah. Wrapped in plastic. Yeah. <laughs> right? So... Matiti Green is into uh, sustainability advisory. And okay. then we have our bespoke tree planting project where we leverage AI and blockchain. You leverage uh, AI and blockchain into tree planting. Yes. So it's it's all a virtual experience for the end user. So they're not really going to the tree. Mm-hmm. And who has the time to go to the tree in a rural area? Mm-hmm. But we bring the tree to your desktop, to your laptop, to your mobile device. So I can right? trap it. I can track it. I can yes, map it. Yes. I know exactly where my tree is. So it's, it's a 4D experience already. Mm-hmm. So you can track it and know the location of the tree. Uh, you can name the tree. So okay. you want to name it after yourself, your children, your parents, your employees. You can do that. 
there is an AI chat board so you can chat with the tree. So there is a chat happening and now we have forest sounds. So if you wanted to put your headphones while you're yeah. visiting your tree, you can also listen to the sounds sounds of the tree. super relaxing. Yes, yeah. yes. So that's Matiti Green and then we have uh, Matiti Capital which is our trade financing arm. Um, so yeah, this is, this is how our business came together and uh, going back to our definition, being in multiple states, right? Yeah. So we, we want to be able to offer more than just one service to our client so they do not have to onboard 10 different vendors for a project, right? Um, so yeah, this is this is how far we have come, but uh, there there is many many goals for us in the future. How do you see the role of technology play into sustainability today? Do you think tech will help solve a lot of climate change problems that we see today, or do you think we need more than technology? Is it more community focused, or how do you see the future of tech and sustainability shape in the near future? Technology is the future, right? And the more we leverage it, the more we embrace it. To do better for ourselves, uh, I think that that would be phenomenal. You have to adapt to the changes that are happening around you for the good of it, right? Okay. Um, so if technology enables, which I th- I'm sure it does, enables you to have a more credible output out of your initiative, it allows it to be more transparent, uh, it offers more efficiency to the project, then we need to embrace it. Okay. So tech and sustainability can go hand in hand and they should go. They should go hand, hand in, in hand. hand. Yes, yes. You can use tech for good. Of course. I am a full, full supporter of tech for good. Hmm. Absolutely. What about AI? What role does AI play in <laughs> shaping sustainability as well? I think AI is game changing. I mean, very simple example of the projects we are running, how it's adding so much value to our work, right? So it will depend on us as uh, as future, you know, business owners, the budding entrepreneurs, uh, the techies, the, you know, people who endorse tech for good, how they want to leverage the power and the might of AI to do better in terms of, uh, you know, better forecasts of their business, uh, better collaboration with, um, I do not know, different technologies that are emerging and will emerge in the future. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a game changer. What do you think, Shreya? You believe that? I I think AI doesn't come without flaws, of course. And there is this balance between will technology save us? Will technology solve all of our problems? And I think there needs to be a balance between focusing on people and communities and also technology at the same time. Because if you're not leveraging indigenous knowledge, if you're not tapping into what people want and what people need on ground, no amount of tech is going to help them. So I think that it just needs to run some sort of relationship, some sort of, you know, balance between the two Mm -hmm. that we don't fully focus on tech and we don't fully lose out on people at the same time. Just in the melting pot of all the discussion on technology, I think the mindset is the game changer as well. Yeah, mindset, empathy, putting people first. All of that. It can't just be the E of ESG. You have to bring the social in. You have to bring policies in. You have to have regulations in at the same time. The governance around it. Misuse. Um anything that we're developing yes. because like you said it comes from humans yes and it can very well fall in the wrong hands yes yes and that's um i think that's a lot of work needs to be done around around that as well fully agree with you what advice do you have for anyone who's in the green tech space who's in the uh, sustainability space or is trying to build something off scratch which is heading towards hmm. a more you know sustainable climate tech hmm. climate friendly technology building that um, I think one is uh, define the value of it, uh, and I spoke about it earlier, right? Uh, what value it brings to the work you're doing, and what value does it bring to the community? And if not just your community, to communities at large, right? Define that value. Second, for me, is creating awareness, right? Many a times I've seen some projects fail because people do not understand uh, why are they doing it, right? So creating awareness around the why of your work right uh yes you know it and you are great at it but do people understand right uh and then the third thing like you were touching upon very very critical is the governance around it Mm -hmm. because technology in wrong hands can can really be very devastating right absolutely so for individuals to follow the protocols and the governments, governance and the governments and the, you know, the bodies that are equitable for that, mm-hmm. to have and define those governance models is very, very critical. Mm-hmm. 
So those those would be my few cents. Definitely. Yeah. Does your spiritual practice add to your business practice? Is there anything that you draw from spirituality that you use in your day-to-day -day work? <laughs> I will let you in on a secret. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> All of it. Really, really. Yeah. Uh, because I I do not see me or let's say I do not associate myself as a brain or I do not associate myself as a heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, again, using an analogy, analogy here. Brain for me is the business and the heart is my spirituality, right? I do not associate or disassociate from either of them. Mm -hmm. For me, it's about, you know, trying to bring in the alignment and sync and balance with both of those, right? Mm -hmm. So like I was saying earlier, as much as I want to do my morning routine, mm -hmm. But I also have a certain parameters defined for myself when I start to do my work yeah. in terms of, you know, what I wish to achieve today, in the next week or in the next month. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's me making a conscious effort of creating a beautiful harmony between my practical life and spiritual life. Uh, my practical life teaches me some. My spiritual life teaches me much more. And yeah, it's about finding that right balance without freaking my husband out. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the biggest challenge oh, of them all. Yeah, is yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm still trying to find a way to bring mindfulness into what I do, to understand that it's not about speed. Sometimes it's just about taking a step back and really looking at where you are right now before figuring out where you want to go next. Yes. How do you practice mindfulness in business in the work that you do? Right. Look. Uh, mindfulness, when you talk about it, it's such a big word, right? Um, Will you unpack that for me? Will you unpack mindfulness sure. for me? If you go back to where we started, if we are 100% committed and engaged in what we are doing, uh, and I call it an act of spirituality, it really is kind of coming from the place of mindfulness, right? If you are, Shreya, a 100% which are all here in this room recording this podcast, mm -hmm. you cannot but do justice to those 60, 80, 90 minutes. Yes. Right? So for mindfulness for me is giving you 100%, like 1000%. But again, you know, it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. You have to prepare yourself to be in that state, right? You have to prepare yourself at a mental level, at an emotional level and at a physical level. Mm -hmm. This is for you right and then for your outside world you have to prepare at um, a family level yeah uh, a colleague and a friendship level mm -hmm. and then at a society level so as much as there are three layers to peel here there are three layers to peel there right uh, to create that equitable equilibrium let's say to be in a state of mindfulness right mm -hmm. now when you talk about yourself right so your physical self, so it's about right eating, sleeping patterns, um, exercise, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then it's about your mind, right? Which is how much are you spending time with yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you meditating? Are you uh, reading something which helps you nurture that good side of you? Are you expressing in a way which is by recording, by writing? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're a poet, do you write, you know, something that is melodious? I do not. Do you paint, right? Just expressing yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, a lot of you comes out, whether you acknowledge it or not, right? Um, and let me check. Do you remember the third level within yourself? No. We said mind, body and? Spirit, soul. Yes. Yeah. So at the soul level, um, it really is about... And again, you might say, Charles, give me more. But I really want to leave it at that because it will have to be your own journey. journey. Is yeah. to go with the flow. Go back to the quote that I used about truth and lie. Yeah. And you will know when you are listening to your heart and when you're not listening to your heart. So how Dada Shriji explains is when you get an answer for any question from within, and there is no fight, there is no challenge, there's no resistance you know it's from your heart. Mm -hmm. But when you get an answer and immediately there is a counter attack that, no, 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 but it could be this. But oh, what if it was that? Mm -hmm. Oh, but I have explored this and this did not. When, when that chatter starts, mm -hmm. it's, it's not your heart, it's your mind. So connect to your heart more mm -hmm. and you will know that you will have clarity. 
and it will lead you into a state of mindfulness. So that is at a personal level. As you go into who Shreya is, who Charul is as a physical identity, right? It's about very, very important, Shreya, that especially in Asian community, we do not have this, um, let's say, culture of defining boundaries. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, we're all in each other's businesses. Yes. Yeah. And, and look, it's beautiful. It's, it's, I, I actually like that part of our Asian community. I missed that when I lived in Scandinavia. <laughs> I wish people would interfere. I wish I, I could see people more often. Yes, and yes, we weren't that yes. individualistic, that each to their own. We didn't grow up that way. We right. grew up with the community. We right. grew up, you know, right. with, like I said, just everyone's nose and everyone yeah. else's business. <laughs> and that's amazing, right? At, yeah. a, at a community level. But when, when you talk about family, right? When I say define boundaries, it's about how much do you allow who to impact you. Mm. So the words of your, of your, let's say, sister, mm. how much do you allow it to impact you or who you become? Mm. And when I say impact, mostly negatively impact, right? Because yeah. I've suffered it, right? So You've had voices of other people in your head that you knew oh, were not, not that yours. wasn't your voice, that no, was not your no, narrative. No, no. It was someone else who might have said that or may not have said that, but it's that playing in your yes. head over and over again. And, and the reason I talk about it at a family level is because these people, they love you. Mm. They mean well. But very unknowingly, most of the time, mm. there is a damage that's done. And that stays with you. And yes. because it is out of a bond of love, mm. it goes deep into our consciousness. Why is that love more confining than any other love? Because it's not confining. Where I sit, I see it very liberating. Ex define confining. Sometimes... I think your loved ones do not want you to change just out of their definition of how they look at you. That love could look like maybe you shouldn't go there. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Are you? It might come out of protection. Yes. It might come out of I want to see you thrive, but also yes. in a in a space of safety. Right. Within boundaries of you being safe and right. within boundaries of maybe those boundaries could be confined. Right. That's right. what I mean. Because sometimes that love that comes mm. from your closest ones. Yes. Could be. I agree with Limiting. that. Yes, I agree with that. Um, but if it is in your fate to experience something mm. and to go through a learning, uh, it's like, uh, I'll give a very funny example of arranged marriage in the Asian society. <laughs> Have I been through it? <laughs> Do you want me to go there? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I think I've been in, I come from a Jain, Marwadi Jain family. So obviously okay. there's a lot of pressure. There's yeah. a lot of, um, you know, biodata that come. My biodata circulated everywhere without my knowledge or consent. Wow. So there's of course okay. that pressure. Yes, yes. But um, I've, I'm just at a point where it'll, I know it'll happen when it has to happen. Right. And right. I don't have to follow anybody else's timelines. You say it today, right? Yeah. Having burnt a few fingers, right? Yeah. So that was your journey, right? Mm -hmm. And to on the hindsight, there are people who have gone through similar experience and have beautiful, positive journeys for themselves. Mm -hmm. From where I sit, Shreya, your journey was very positive as well mm -hmm. because it's shaped you to becoming who you eventually will become, right? Uh, it's difficult to go through that, but it was a positive experience from where I see it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've been through my share of experiences as well. But to, to going back to my point, right, yeah. that, that, that family and the definition of boundary is not about, oh, I should be secretive, I should not share, mm -hmm. or nobody should be, you know, having, putting their nose in no one's business. No, it's a family, right? Yeah. But it's about defining how you allow somebody to impact or affect you. And that is a very, it's, it's, it's a matter of self-discipline. Then it's, it's not about telling somebody else, don't do this. It's about telling yourself that when somebody speaks to me, I will not do this to myself. Right? So if having you, stronger boundaries with yourself. It's not about other people. It's just about, with yourself, I will not let this in. Yes, with yourself in the context of others. Right? Because you love your mother. You love your parents. You love your siblings and your grand, grandparents if you have, right? Mm -hmm. But... How much are you allowing them to negatively influence you without them knowing that they are doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that. Uh, it, it's, it's like a four-hour workshop that I'm trying to squeeze in four sentences <laughs> here. here. <laughs> the next level is, is your friend circle, the social circle that you mingle with, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to only talk about boundaries here, mm -hmm. right? Because that is what will lead to that mindfulness where we started mm -hmm. so here is charul being all mindful mm -hmm. she's worked on the three layers for herself mm -hmm. 
now she's working on the three layers that surround her the physical which is the f- mind and the soul. soul which is here internally yeah. and externally is the family the social circle and the community yeah right so family we spoke about social circle is exactly the same mm-hmm. going back and it's beautifully coming together we spoke about you know define your tribe who you vibe with right who are those people who you call friends mm-hmm. and this could this this could evolve huh? some people who will stay your friends forever for the whole life yeah. and there's some people who'll come and they have a part to play and they'll go and you outgrow so many relationships and friendships as well don't even get me started <laughs> on that uh, after i wrote the book uh, yeah. i have shed a lot of so called good friends uh, was that shedding liberating it was uh, it was very painful to start with because uh, it was not initiated by me it was initiated by them uh and i think it's it's not the book i think the book came as a tipping point in the journey so after winning the crown and then you know um uh, thank god i i was on the front page of gulf news uh i was on college times and then i got onto several podcasts many articles came but that's uh, amazing the business flew you see that way the others don't right and it's their choice right but people who you sometimes associate with as a friend um I I would call it you outgrow them but they they fail to see you grow and they fail to see you happy mm-hmm. and uh, there has been a huge learning share there for me mm-hmm. because um it was very painful for me and it, it it is coming to you know that mindfulness about the community level who you allow to you know mm-hmm. get into that space where they start to hurt you um mm-hmm. uh, and uh and i can tell you people who grow mm-hmm. uh especially people who come from humble be- beginnings and you know people people you people you thought were your friends some of them were actually enjoying uh seeing you and offering their pity for you and they like you being there they like you being small uh, i i don't want to use that word but when somebody can pity you somehow they look bigger than you right hmm. so i have uh, i have had uh, some people who who i considered friends uh who <laughs> uh was so used to seeing me in a state of pity that they enjoyed seeing me there and when my life started to turn around uh it was difficult for them to um appreciate that for me or be happy for me and it's really uh, the exact opposite of what a friendship yes i'm supposed to yes feel yes. or do yes. for you yes yeah. some who told it to me my, on my face and it hurts uh some told you what you know what i've just said to you yeah <laughs> that uh you know people package it differently right some are very careful of how they say it they'll say oh we're very happy for you but you've become so busy and you know you you are in a different circle and I think you know we go our different ways and they keep it amicable mm-hmm. there are others who go drilling down to the point it starts to hurt you so bad uh so yeah i've had both yeah. um i think that's what i meant by your identity shifting and people can't keep up with that because they know a version yes. of you and it's so easy to just know and stick to that version of you with that when you start changing and you start going through these shifts i'm sure that also came with spirituality coming into your life Absolutely. you become a different person and some if someone else can't hold that space for you that's when i think it becomes about finding faults in you and not really in the in their own journey yes but i don't know if you think it was more about a reflection of what they were not doing with themselves yes. it was yes. maybe you were reflecting untapped potential within maybe their lives that they weren't ready to confront yet which is why they feel very uncomfortable around you because you're showing them the mirror that they don't want to see right uh but you know as much as it's their journey it's also a learning and it's a part of my journey because yeah, outgrowing people who do not mean much to you is is easy outgrowing people who you held close to your heart and uh expect again you know it's all expectations right yeah uh that can be very hurtful so you know that 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 social circle and friendship mm-hmm. sometimes has far more impactful mm-hmm. consequences than your family so we have to watch out for that right mm-hmm. in a, in a nice way right and then the third is community mm-hmm. 
the lesser I say, the better. <laughs> Do not let them influence you whichever way, especially in the mm. you know digital era we live in with so many views of so many people and you could not be sure of what it means to them, let alone how much it should impact you. Mm. I think uh, the lesser we put an impact and emphasis on all of that impacting your inner state, the better. Because we live in a community which is shifting so quickly from one minute to another. Mm. Um, yeah, if you want to stay abreast with what's happening around you, you, you are somebody who likes to you know, have a pulse uh, of you know what what's what's trending and yeah what's working what's not it's good uh, but there is there is no better way for me to say but say that stay away from all of that impacting your inner state mm. so too much of social media exposure too much of uh, you know consuming content mm. and then of course you know when we when we talk about mental health you know there are patterns that we talk about all science uh, based facts right mm. how much should you read before you go off to sleep how much should you and when should you read after you wake up mm the kind of content you expose yourself to there is there's such beautiful things that you can do to this beautiful engine that has been gifted to us this human body yeah uh, but but you know we have to define those three boundaries externally and internally to get into that state of mindfulness how do you extend love to all of these circles how do you extend love to the family sphere the friend sphere the community sphere and weave collective consciousness through it all while are you receiving my love right now i am and how do you know that it's it's just the energy you i feel felt it, that right? since you were in this room yeah <laughs> yeah that's how, that's how the tears <laughs> oh, you're tearing up again <laughs> <laughs> i love you Shreya. Yeah. no me too thank you um so you can only offer love when you're filled with love right you cannot ever pour from an empty cup so if you want to be able to <laughs> wear all those tissues. We kept those tissues handy <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it just, it, honestly, it's just your energy. Thank you. Yeah. It's, I felt that. I felt the light. I felt, I felt the connection the minute you walked in. I'm so glad you did. So thank you for touching me with that light. It's more that. And opening up to it as well. Because there was that opening up that I could tap into. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, and again, you know, all of that goes to the point that, you know, fill yourself up with light mm. and then you can offer it to others. It's the same as, I mean, if you look at the brain concepts of knowledge, mm. if you do not have knowledge, if you don't have experience, why would you call me here to share it with you, right? Mm. So to be able to pour into someone else's cup, you have to fill your cup first. How do you fill your cup? What overfills your cup so that you can pour onto others? Um, th there are many things, right? And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a big work in progress. Mm. But uh, there have been few anchors for me mm. that allow me to be in that state, mm. right? And if you remember, I spoke about the triple A approach, right? Yeah. Let, me, let me check on you. <laughs> <laughs> Awareness, alignment, there was one more. Awareness alignment. Anchor. And anchor. <laughs> Literally, you said three anchors, not just like anchors. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be the straightest student. I'm going to repeat that again. So that was awareness, alignment, and anchor. Anchoring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, a lot of that comes from me having a solid anchor, right? Anchor within me. Now, what is an anchor? Now, anchor could be um, a skill that you specialize in. An anchor could be your spiritual guru, which is the fact in my case, he's my anchor. Your anchor could be uh, somebody in the family who you love dearly and follow to any bits. Uh, your anchor could be your own self, right? So finding that anchor in life is extremely critical because, you know, just a turbulent sea. Yeah. And if you do not, you're not anchored somewhere, you will flow with the tide. You will, you will not have any direction. You'll just get slapped by the waves mm -hmm. and you'll go whichever way the, 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 waves, the waves take, take you, you, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of people enjoy that state. Is that, is that the state of surrender? Is that different from the state of surrender, to be in a state of flow? Mm -hmm. Is you either just surrender to the forces, wherever they want to take you, or you try to control? Very beautiful question. From where I see it, mm. surrendering leads to anchoring. Wow. 
Yeah. How so? Because if you think you know your anchor, right? So let's say you are a huge ship, a huge cruise ship, right? Going back to the analogy, right? And you find a little nail in the sand there. You're like, hey, I found my anchor. Mm. <laughs> and you go put your rope around it and you yeah. are this 300 room cruise ship. Yeah. And there comes a storm. What will happen? It won't stand. Yeah, but you had your anchor, right? Mm. You, you see where I'm going with this? So when you surrender, right, is you saying, okay, I will now identify how big is my ship? How big is the ocean? Is the sand shifting here or do I need to go further towards the shore? Mm. Right? It's, it's me understanding the dynamics in which I'm working mm. and not wanting to change it. I can't reduce the shape or the size of my cruise to fit that nail as an yeah. anchor. Yeah. I cannot change the demographics of the shore I am parked at mm. just because my anchor is that nail. I have to adapt to my surroundings, right? I cannot change the mighty waves, right? Mm. But I can shift my anchor. So can your anchors change as well? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Till five years back, I thought I had an anchor without me actually calling it an anchor. Mm. And I thought that was my parents. Mm. And, and they were for the longest time. Mm. You know, for whatever I went through, mm. they were always there, you know, a shoulder to cry on, uh, people to share it with, mm. people to go back to. But I think I needed more for me to elevate myself, for me to outgrow my older version, right? Mm. And um, I had to surrender, mm. right? I had to accept my circumstances. I had to be aware and align. And that's when the next anchor appeared, which was my spiritual teacher, mm. right? So, and I've never said it. It's all coming through your beautiful questions, right? Uh, and, I'm, and I'm so glad you asked that question because surrendering is what will lead to your anchoring wow yeah because we we try to control a lot of outcomes without surrendering and a lot of people talk about the state of surrender and how that just gets you to wherever you want to be yes but as humans we want to control the output we want to control the results and have our say regardless yeah. of whatever is you know set for us for those people i have a suggestion do it your way <laughs> <laughs> do it see with. the result yeah and then take my advice or our advice and surrender now surrender uh, as as a lot of uh, clients who I coach leaders I coach a lot of them they call surrender as giving up yes oh are you saying I should let all my guards down mm -hmm. what will my CEO think of me mm -hmm. I can't surrender mm -hmm. surrender is anything but that mm -hmm. yeah surrender is not putting your guards down surrender is not uh, uh letting people humiliate you or insult you or show you down it's that's not surrender mm -hmm. surrender is acceptance is accepting what is happening around you mm -hmm. right surrender is not fighting your circumstance mm -hmm. so it's like okay uh, when i was coming today to this studio and there was a little mix up with the location right so i when i say surrender now that's my that's my continuous state i work towards it consciously mm -hmm. right so for me, it was very clear that if I'm being delayed by five minutes is because she's supposed to receive me after five minutes. If I'm... Such a beautiful way to think about it. That's yeah. surrender. Could I, could I fight when I'm late five minutes? Yeah. Can I change it? No. No. There's nothing that could have gotten you here five minutes earlier. <laughs> earlier, right? Yeah. There are times when I'm invited to two different events. Mm. Let's say one is an award ceremony and other is a keynote in front of some very important people. Now, what do I choose? <laughs> One is important than the other, yeah. right? Now, what I, what I mean that I surrender is, I go within and I, and I analyze what helps me fulfill that value that I defined for myself. Mm. And if it is that keynote, mm. I will let that award be. And it has happened. I'm, I'm saying it because it has happened to me. You've chosen the keynote over yes, receiving an award. Because I felt that will help me fulfill my value for that day or for that month, right? So I went ahead with that that is surrendering it's not uh, putting yourself down or letting people walk all over you or feeling like a victim it's none of that it's everything beautiful I love that thank you pleasure pleasure so that's what fills your cup your anchors are what fill your cup yes that gives you the energy to that's like my recharge boot boot yeah <laughs> you go get your recharge done and you know when you when you find your anchor Let's just go a little bit deeper. It's, it's your building your association with that anchor. Mm -hmm. 
So going back to the analogy of the ship, mm-hmm. let's say for that cruise ship, you found the right anchor. Mm-hmm. So no matter what, storms or calm seas or whatever, you, you anchored. You move, you shift, but you come back to your position, right? Mm-hmm. Now, every now and then there will be wear and tear. So you might have to change the rope or the hook might get rusty. So you have to, so to my example here with my, my, my teacher or whatever it is, your anchor, you have to work on building that relationship with your anchor, mm. right? So if you have to service <laughs> that anchor, <laughs> yeah. if you may, in this analogy, mm. change the hook, you know, look at the wear and tear of the rope, uh, change the direction because the hole is getting loose, whatever it is, right? Mm. So, so it's still reci- there's still some sort of reciprocity. There's still some sort of work that you need to put in yes. to hold on to that anchor. Everything should be work in progress. Everything. Because the moment you think it's over, you know, you're stopping your own growth. Everything should be work in progress. I know it's very difficult for you to talk about it, but having gone through the IVF process, I just wanted to touch upon that a little sure. bit. I know there's a lot of women out there that might have gone through something similar and have had their, I've had to maybe bury their dreams of becoming a mother. Is there mm. anything you'd like to tell them? Wow. <laughs> it's such an emotional piece, right? Um, I mean, my message to them is give it your best and leave the rest, you know, because um, if you have heard the podcast so far to those women, you know uh, the beauty of surrendering, right? Mm. So do not fight your circumstances. Do not play the victim. However, what is very, very important is to keep trying. So I'm not asking or encouraging anybody to stop trying Mm. uh, because there have been miracles there, out there, right? Mm. Uh, People who thought it was the end of the road and they were blessed with twins or triplets or whatever, right? Mm. So... I'm not saying sit and, you know, anticipate a miracle. You have to stay positive. You have to keep trying. But stay in that state of surrender. Do not fight your circumstances. Do not uh, think less of yourself and your body. Because there's a lot of people who end up cursing their fate, Mm -hmm. cursing their bodies, their inability to bear a child. Um, it's it's uh, as much as they think it's their doing, it's not their doing. It's also a lot of societal pressure. Might be a lot of people yes. hurting you intentionally or unintentionally as well. And and let me say this without hurting anybody's sentiments, right? And I don't say it from a place of bitterness, mm-hmm. but having a child does it in any way guarantee your happiness for the rest of your life? Mm-hmm. I have known mm-hmm. many many parents mm-hmm. who have. Uh, who have had a beautiful family in terms of a husband and a wife and how many other kids they wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've, they've, uh, they have gone through some huge uh, challenges mm-hmm. uh, within their families uh, and they've lived a very lonely life, mm-hmm. right? So a life can be as fulfilling as you want if you just surrender to what it has to offer you. Uh, keep trying because uh, being inactive is is a state of uh, a decline, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't want to be there. Uh, stay at it if that's what you really want. Look at different options. Uh, the science is very progressive. Mm-hmm. And I think in times to come, they will just, I do not know, they will just put babies through AI in us or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but don't let that be the end state for you. Because you're so much more than just being a mother. It's very fulfilling, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I wish uh, that joy came in my life. But uh, life has rewarded me beautifully for surrendering and accepting my circumstances. That's how they get to acceptance as well, no matter where they are. Yes. In in their journey. Yes. Is there any advice you have um, for anyone who's beginning on their path to spirituality, who's just exploring that and who's trying to figure this out because it is a big word. Yes. Even for me to unpack spirituality, it looks different on everybody. It yes. means different things yes. to different people. Yes. How do we begin to unpack that? Right. Look, uh, for spirituality, uh, how the other Shriji explains it, right? Mm-hmm. Do not get caught up in what spirituality means to somebody else. Mm-hmm. 
right so people say read a lot of books and read this and read that please read my book <laughs> <laughs> it's it's right here for yeah. everybody to see it that's eye to eye if you'd like to tell eye to eye with eye eye to eye with eye would you like to tell our listeners a little bit more about that as well yeah sure um so uh briefly yeah so mm-hmm. eye to eye with eye so after i got introduced to maitri bodh parivar right mm-hmm. going back into our discussion today uh after i moved you know very very randomly got into that room and did the first teaching right after my failed ivf uh long story short i was told i will meet the founder matra dadashri ji very soon after that and i found myself four years down the line and i had still not met him so i was very bitter i was childlike you know when somebody takes away your toy and you're like i'm not going to talk to you <laughs> even if you show up i will never speak to you so i was uh, i was very bitter i was very childlike uh, i was inconsolable and uh, finally uh, would you believe it was only last year <laughs> 2022 yes when i met him for the first time what was that like uh, there are three chapters dedicated to that that first meeting right yeah. of uh, what it meant and uh, what all i had to go through to be in his physical presence and how much of an impact it had on me uh, it was it was a life changing experience without me knowing it at that time that i was going through that change it was so subtle and it was so beautiful um so when i met him for the first time i came back and from 2018 till last year when i met him there were many experiences that i was having uh experiences in the sense of uh you you would say and imagine something and it would just happen to you or uh you were talking about something and you get an answer in your dream and you actually check would on that, that. Spook you? No. That no 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 i was flowing beautifully okay. through it uh when you know somebody was thinking about you and you texted and called them and they're like oh my god i was just talking about you or i was just thinking about you that to me happens on a daily basis nowadays and i'm very grateful for that so somewhere your consciousness is getting elevated right so i was one day starting to just record all that so what started happening was every time i would have an experience i would audio file myself or i would quickly write a note if i was at work and it started coming together as very different experiences right so in my head somewhere i was like one day i'll write a book about it mm-hmm. um when i met him uh, may of last year uh it was a life changing experience like i said without me knowing it uh, the first three chapters only talk about that i came back and uh one day after my meditation i thought of this title right and uh, literally shreya i took a a4 size and a print, a4 size paper and a printer i went online found this eye i really like the eye so i bought the image yeah. <laughs> i put the image and in mm. an arial whatever font i put the title i printed it in color and i put it on my desk uh, on my workstation yeah. eye to eye with eye yeah so in hindi they call it atma sakshatkar right um so i put it on my workstation it stayed there for a few months Next time I met him was at a retreat that happens in the foothills of Himalayas in Dunagiri. Mm-hmm. I met him in uh, when was it? September of last year. Beautiful beautiful time. I do not know why I took that print out paper in you know in those uh, plastic folders. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> every time you meet him you can get different things blessed by him, right? Okay. He just just blesses them. So when it was my turn for getting things blessed I had an A4 sheet printed <laughs> <laughs> and one of his you know disciples who was taking things he's like what is this and I very confidently said this is a book I'll write <laughs> and you know mm, he blessed it and I took it back with me right and I internally made myself a promise when I meet you next dada I'll bring this book to you I thought the first meeting took 4 5 years this will take another 10 years. <laughs> right. So bought yourself 10 years that's what you thought. Mm. And then uh, fast forward March uh, March of this uh, not this year anymore 2023 mm. and uh, I had like 5000 words together of different experiences that I was putting together. So I was like yeah yeah my book is coming together. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing nothing about book writing mind mm. you. And uh, I got a call and uh, there was another level of learning that was being released and we were invited to attend and uh, dada shri ji was conducting it so we were over the moon me and my husband that you know we'll get to be in his presence again 
But for me, it meant having the book ready. <laughs> Look at the ambitious me. This was March. I was like, yeah, yeah, we have to go in April. One yeah. month, I will whip the book together, oh right? Oh, my God. And uh, life carried on, and I was very busy. It was a very busy month for us, Shreya. Yeah. Uh, and then I found myself a week before the travel <laughs> date. And uh, we have his little idol at home, a picture. And uh, I'm... I do not come across as somebody who breaks down very easily. I broke down in front of his <laughs> picture and I was like, look, I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm a woman of my word, but this time you'll have to cut me a slack. <laughs> I am one week away from yeah. meeting you and uh, I will not keep my promise. Mm. And I surrendered, yeah, mm. and something shifted. So next morning, I got a message from my friend of a friend who said, hey, your publisher is here in Dubai. He's doing a free workshop. I know you've been wanting to write a book. Do you want to come? I said, yeah, it was a Saturday. I have nothing to do. I'll come. And I had that guilt about not writing a book. So I said, <laughs> I'll just go. <laughs> I went and uh, the publishers, you know, I have done this and I've done that and we have done this. So I just very sheepishly raised my hand. I was like, I have a question for you. How do I write a book in three days? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was that ugly? <laughs> <laughs> and you know the whole the whole room turned and like who's this lunatic <laughs> I was like I have to write a book in three days can you make it happen for me and oh uh, he said if you will write it I will publish it and let's talk later so I was like uh huh <laughs> and uh, after the event we spoke and we both thought we were being super you know funny about it very impractical yeah. Yeah. but the next morning our call was booked for 6 a.m. Uh, he coached me through the process. He's like, I've never done this. And I was like, uh, how much time do I have? He's like, if you have to take the printed book with you in seven days, uh, you have to finish writing it in three days. Oh, God. And uh, Shreya, it was around 8.30 in the morning that day I sat down to write. Uh, and again, thanks to my husband, the food, the coffee, everything. <laughs> everything <was appeared>. coming <laughs> in. in your cave, in your yes, little... Yes, yes, yes. I, I would just take, you know, my bio breaks... And yeah. that was it. And three days later was our next call booked. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk to the publisher now, he laughs about it because <laughs> it's become quite a story in his uh, in yeah. his uh, experience as a publisher. I'm sure. And he's like, I thought you will have all the reasons why you did not do it. But yeah. here I was. And when he said, how many words? I was like, I was not counting. So together, yeah. we did the word count. It was around 59,000 words. From 5,000 words that you mm -hmm. that you thought you had a book out of to yeah. 59,000 <laughs> words. And he said, oh, this can be two books. Because an ideal book is like 25,000, 30,000. I was like, no, 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 it's all come out. This will be one book. And um, after that, wow. uh, we printed the book, took it. Um, Dada was very, very graceful. He inaugurated or unveiled the book in front of 180 people in the ashram. Uh, and then we, when I came back is when we did the whole proofreading, the preface, the acknowledgements, you know, all the <laughs> dressing up, yeah. uh, some grammar changes. And uh, I went for a photo shoot to get a nice picture. Done. <laughs> if I showed you the initial you one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah a lot of good things happen after that and now we are a bestseller thankfully I, I can't believe you pulled that off in three days so can't I sometimes uh, but uh, such is the power of surrendering mm. so whoever was listening so far mm. and they thought I was bluffing it mm -hmm. here is your proof <sighs> incredible thank you Wow. <laughs> That's how the universe shows up for you. I think everything that I've heard so far, somehow you've always been guided. Somehow you've always been protected. There is something looking after after you. There is someone looking after you. And it's shown up for you yeah. just when you needed it. Yeah. And, and when you will be in that state, when I say you, I, I mean everyone, mm -hmm. you will start to reflect back upon your life and you will say exactly the same things that you were being looked after, that somebody was looking out for you, somebody was protecting you. Uh, again, go to the AAA awareness. <laughs> yeah, I, I got it. I got it. It was awareness, <laughs> alignment, alignment anchoring. and anchoring. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as people start to become aware mm. and they will look back at their life and they'll realize how protected, how guided, how sheltered they all were. Mm. And so was I. We, no one is an exception. What are we here to do? What are we all here to do? To serve each other. In, in very simple, like there's no story to it, no analogy to it in plain, simple words. The purpose is, is 
to serve each other how can be how can we be of service to each other you are already doing a service again be aware of it right you're doing a service you're recording this podcast for example while you're fulfilling your ambition of doing something for yourself you are delivering that value sometimes knowingly sometimes unknowingly and to be honest if listening to this podcast one life changes That's just one that. or one part of one's life changes it is all worth it how do we begin to envision a kind of more compassionate world in a world where there's climate change there's genocide we're destroying the environment we are um incredibly exploiting the planet mm. as well mm. and harming ourselves in the process yeah how do we bring love into this how do we bring kindness into this how do we tap into spirituality to change our future or you know make this a utopia that we all want to live in harmoniously mm. together you know be the start of the change that you want to see in the world because it all starts at some place right even when a tree becomes the mighty tree it is it starts by sowing a single seed right and then giving it the right nourishment for it to thrive and grow right so it will it will all have to start with you whether you like it or not and you know everybody i talk to the first question is i don't matter or my view does not matter what can i do as an individual and if you say that you've lost the battle mm. you've given up your arms before even entering the battlefield right mm. and imagine if everybody starts to think like that mm. then that's the end of this universe right so my humble advice is as righteous as it sounds that's mm. that's really the truth of it mm. that each one of us has to start to take the right steps for our own selves and define that value that we spoke about mm-hmm. start to be aware of what's happening to us mm-hmm. surrender to life find those anchors mm-hmm. and be that light for someone else and always and always find value in serving others until the time and i think to to credit to you and the way this conversation flowed and now that i'm kind of pulling it all together mm-hmm. it kind of has a beautiful narration to it right it and and my my humble ask to anybody who's listening to this podcast today is start it with yourself just do that much to yourself and you could be as selfish as you want and not think about anybody else just work upon yourself but know that when you work upon yourself you will eventually end up supporting and serving others that's just the way it goes thank you so much for being here today charul I'm so grateful for your presence. I'm so grateful for your light. I'm so grateful for the love that I felt throughout this conversation and I know the light that shines in you is going to illuminate so many other lives. So thank you so much for everything that you do and um all of my love and support to every uh, the vision board that you have for 2024 as well. Thank and you. And all the lives you're going to impact. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Shreya. It was a pleasure being here. Thank, thank you, you so much.